Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. On the screen, also on page 572 of the Pew Bibles, Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attacked us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. You may be seated. Will you please join me in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this sacred hour that you've created for us in this sacred space with this sacred people. And we thank you for your sacred word that was proclaimed here and now. Father, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be perfect and pleasing to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. During the first week of October in 2013, my wife and I were at home with our kids and we were awaiting a very, very important phone call. This phone call had been scheduled for a couple weeks at this point and we knew that this phone call was going to, had the potential to radically change our life. You see, just a few months before, we had found ourselves in a situation in the ministry we worked with in North Africa where Simply put, we were under incredibly unbiblical leadership. It was leadership that wasn't the sort of um, situation our family needed to be under. It wasn't the sort of leadership that I wanted to serve under. It wasn't the sort of leadership that Shannon wanted to serve under. It wasn't the sort of leadership we wanted our kids to look at and experience for themselves. Because what this leadership was doing is it was simply saying that Shannon, as a woman, was pretty much worthless to ministry. And Shannon and I don't believe that at all. <laughs> we believe that Shannon, as my wife, and we believe that 50% of the world's population aren't second-class citizens, but can do every single thing that God has called them to do. And the way that this particular person um, practiced out this belief, it was just, it was grotesque, and it was humiliating, to my wife, and it was not the sort of thing that was going to produce any fruitful ministry. So we had a choice to make. We could either choose to remain under this individual's leadership, or we could choose to resign from this particular team and run the risk of having to come home, because there might not be another ministry team in North Africa that we could serve among. Because we weren't going to go alone. That's just not a safe it wasn't a safe, smart thing for our family to be alone in a Muslim country um, trying to figure it all out on our own. Uh, we were just not in a position to do that. So we had made the choice to resign from this team, and we were hoping and we were praying that the Lord would provide another way for us to serve in North Africa, in the land that we loved and among the people that we loved. The phone rang, and I picked it up, and I answered it, and I knew immediately from the sound of this guy's voice that he, this was our area leader at the time, and he just, he had no other option for us. He couldn't find a place for us to, he couldn't find a team for us to serve among, and so the answer was no. No, you're not going back to Africa at this time. And um, the tears ran down my face, and Shannon immediately knew the answer. And um, the bottom line was that our dream had been lost. All that we had worked for for a decade, literally a decade, had been gone, just like that. And we were completely clueless as to what the next day would hold for us. Completely clueless. And I realize, as I, I, I can't feel too sorry for myself, because I realize that we all go through moments like this in life. We all go through moments like this where we feel like we've just been punched in the gut, and we fall to our knees, 
We, we feel like the world is crashing down all, of, all around us. We have absolutely nowhere to hide. We don't have that dad catching us when we're riding the bike. We're going to fall. We're going to crash and burn. We're at the end of our rope. But the great thing about Scripture, the great thing about this book up here, the book that we're learning from today, is that it's full of people who are at the end of their ropes. It's full of people whose worlds are just crashing down all around them. We like to look at the Bible and we like to think that it's full of these heroes that we should place on a pedestal, when in reality, that's pretty far from the truth. There are some pretty messed up people in that book. I mean, you talk about the best soap operas you could ever even imagine. They're in this book. There are some really, really messed up situations, some people that make some awful, awful decisions, some people that feel like that the world is just crashing down all around them and they have nowhere to hide. And one such person that we often place on a pedestal that, you know, sometimes we need to bring him back down and see the person he truly is, is King David. Yes, Scripture is clear that he is a man after God's own heart, but he's also human, (laughs) just like you and I. He went through some very, very hard times. One particular time is at the beginning of his reign as king. He had just ascended to the throne. He had just, um, Saul, his predecessor, and the guy he was competing against, um, had just died. And so David was finally the true king over all of Israel. And this was a very difficult time for him, a very difficult time, uh, for many reasons, one of which is the Philistines, the, the enemies of anybody who lived in that region, not just Israel, but the enemies of anybody in that area, the Philistines, they had heard of this new king, and they said, okay, we got to attack. Now's our time. Now's our time. So in 2 Samuel 5.17, we see this. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, all the Philistines went up in search of him. All the Philistines. Now, the writer of 2 Samuel could have said 10,000. He could have said 20,000. He could have said 30, 40, 50. He could have said 500,000 Philistines. But no, he said all. All the Philistines. And this simple word is used to imply one thing, that it was David against the world. That's the picture that the writer of 2 Samuel is wanting to get across, that this was a big fight, and that all the odds were stacked against David. We see at the end of this verse that David, when confronted with the truth, when realizing that all the Philistines were coming to attack, in 2 Samuel 5.17, we see that David goes down to the stronghold. He hides. He seeks safety. He's at a loss for what to do next. This new kingdom that he has just acquired, it's being threatened And it's sure to fall apart. This is the context of Psalm 124, what we heard read today. This is why that psalm was written. David being confronted with assured destruction. And it's why he's able to write such a stirring psalm. Because he knows what it's like to have nowhere to turn. He's been there. He knows what it's like to be crouching, hiding in fear. And know that you're going to lose but to be delivered from it. In 2 Samuel 5.19, God tells David, I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. I will certainly give the Philistines into your hand. And just like that, David is sent off with his army, and every single Philistine is defeated. And God has delivered the people of Israel. It's this very event, this miraculous deliverance that David is able to write those stirring opening lines of Psalm 124. And I love how it reads. You know, even though this is a psalm written after the victory has already been won, I'm reminded of all these great movies of of this general in front of their troops, calling their troops to battle. I'm reminded of, of William Wallace and Braveheart standing in front of all of his Scotsmen, getting them ready to fight the English, assuring them that they can do this. And these opening lines of Psalm 124 remind me of that sort of speech. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side... And then he repeats it, let the people now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. This is a psalm of celebration. This is a praise to God for the Lord's complete and total protection over his people. 
a people that were threatened by assured destructions at the hand of the Philistines. At this time, Israel was an incredibly vulnerable people, and the Philistines knew this. David knew this. They had just gone through essentially a civil war between the supporters of David and the supporters of Saul. They were weak politically. They were weak militarily. They weren't unified. They weren't one unified nation. They were incredibly vulnerable, and the Philistines knew this, and David knew this. David knew that they could lose just like that. And this psalm is quite clear on what the implications would have been had God not provided. Israel would have been swallowed up alive, it says in verse 3. The flood of Philistines would have swept them away, in verse 4. And continuing on, the raging waters of their enemies would have completely overwhelmed them. Destruction was a sure thing. David knew it, the people of Israel knew it, and the Philistines knew it. This was a no-brainer. Of course the Philistines were going to win. There would have been total and complete destruction. Not a single remnant of Israel would have been spared. The people of Israel would have been lost to history had it not been for the Lord who was on their side. Shannon and I felt utterly and completely defeated when we received that phone call. There was nowhere else for us to turn to. There was nothing else for us to do. It's not that we knew that defeat was coming. It had already happened. We were done. We were lost. The odds were stacked against us, and there was nowhere else for us to turn to. We felt fear. We felt sadness. We felt defeat. But praise God that the world doesn't revolve around our feelings or our fears, or our trepidations. Praise God that our all-too-often insecurities and lack of faith are completely undone. All of our lack of faith, all of our fear is completely undone because of God's faithfulness. It undoes all of that. God is able to take such a dire situation like the impending doom of Israel and redeem them from the depths of their fear. He was able to take Shannon and I when we were at a place where we had little to no passion for ministry whatsoever. We were done. We had given up. But he was able to take us out of a situation where we were sure we were never going to come from again. And now we're here. Now I'm standing in front of you now, today. God does redeem his people, and he loves to do it through the church. That's what he loves to do most. He loves to rescue his people through the church. And he did that with Shannon and I. He used you at Hilltop United Methodist Church before you even knew us, before we even knew you, to redeem the McQuaig family. And I stand in front of you now as a healed, rescued, redeemed person because of what God has done through you. Remember that, that he uses you, he uses all of us to share his redemption with the world. And I'm passionate about ministry again. My wife is passionate about ministry again. My kids have a church family again. Because God was on our side. But we're not the only ones who go through tough times. I realize that. The people of God, we see it with them. David's kingdom are not the only ones to experience overwhelming odds. We we all experience these things on a regular basis. We all feel like the waters are going to come over our head, that we're going to drown in our troubles. We're all faced with situations where we know we're going to be swallowed up each and every day and destroyed completely. And all this would be true if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side. All of it would be true if it was not for the Lord who was on our side. We serve and worship a God who is able to save us in the depths of our despair here and now through such terrible times such as death, or divorce, or illness, or war, or natural disaster, whatever it might be, God can and will rescue us, but we cannot forget the ultimate depths of despair that God has rescued us from through Christ. It's really easy for us to focus on the physical suffering that we're rescued from, but we must not forget the utter and complete despair that we would be facing if it had not been for the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross who has rescued us from the complete and total destruction of sin. 
Yes, God rescued the people of Israel, and he rescues us as the church here and now, but he also ultimately rescues us from eternal destruction. We can't forget that Scripture says that Satan is the ruler of this world. The odds are stacked against you. They are. The odds are stacked against us. Satan believes he's got it all figured out. He's going to win. In his mind, it's a done deal. Like a weak, fragile, mindless bird, we wander into his trap. We're ensnared by Satan's power, and we're born into this world with our first breaths already enslaved to his power. And none of us, not a single one, are able to escape. We're not able to escape on our own, at least. But we have got to remember the God that we serve. Remember to praise God for his amazing ability and his amazing promise to rescue us out of this total destruction. And David gets this. He better, later on in his life, he experiences such horrendous sin in his life. He's an adulterer. He's a murderer. David understands what it means to be rescued from sin. In Psalm 124, verse 6, he writes, Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. The trap of sin is real. The simple act of being born, we are ensnared by it. But through God's love and grace, as he says in verse 7, we have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowler's. Our mindless bird who unwillingly falls into this trap, we're rescued. We're rescued because in verse 7 we continue to see that the snare is broken and we have escaped. Notice it doesn't say that we break the snare. The snare is broken. God breaks the snare. He crushes the trap. He shatters it. It is useless. The power of sin is made null and void, and we are able to walk free in the love and grace of Jesus Christ. This morning, we're going to have an amazing opportunity to participate in and to witness just what David is calling us to do here in this psalm. He's calling us to proclaim God's total and complete victory over evil in this world. And today we're going to do just that. And I am so incredibly excited. Today, Andrew Dale Gowanlock is going to be baptized. And today, we proclaim as one body, we proclaim to each other, and we proclaim to God, and we proclaim to the world that Andrew does not belong to the ways of the world, but he belongs to the one true living God. We welcome him into our family as our brother, and we welcome him by the power of the Holy Spirit into the covenant of Christ's love and grace, and mercy over each and every one of us. This morning, as we experience and witness and participate in this, we stand as one body and we witness God's love and grace over Andrew. We witness the love that has been pursuing Andrew since he was being knit in his mother's womb, and it will be a love that we promise as one body to journey with him in and to perfect him in his love. No longer will the waters of sin and death and destruction swallow him whole, but rather the sweet, sweet waters of baptism offer a promise to him, a promise to Andrew and to all of us as a community of the church, a community of God, a promise that God is for him and not against him, a a promise that God is for each and every one of us. As we see this baptism, we must remember our own and remember that God is for us and not against us. Yes, suffering and death and destruction, they're a sure thing in this world. It's going to keep happening. We're going to experience it. We're going to suffer from it. We will continue to see it all around us until the day that Christ returns with the kingdom of heaven following with him. But until that day, we have faith, we have hope, and we have assurance in his protection. There was a man named Horatio Spafford who lived in Chicago in the mid-1800s. He had four daughters and a wife, and he was a wealthy lawyer and property investor in Chicago. And he lost pretty much everything he owned in the Great Chicago Fire. Almost all of his investments were lost, and um, he decided to move his family to Europe after they had lost almost everything, to try to go to Europe and start over. 
So his wife and four daughters got on a boat and they crossed the Atlantic while Horatio stayed in Chicago to tie up some loose ends. He was going to join them later. And on their way across the Atlantic, the ship crashed into another vessel and it sank, killing 226 people on board, including all four of Horatio's daughters. 11-year-old Tanetta, 9-year-old Elizabeth, 5-year-old Margaret, and 2-year-old Anna. Horatio had obviously heard of this crash on the news, and he was waiting to receive word from his wife, and his wife telegrammed him back home with just two words, saved alone. When it was time for Horatio to cross the Atlantic to join his wife on the other side of the world, they passed by the exact area where the ship went down, where all four of his daughters perished, and the Holy Spirit moved in his heart, He pulled out a piece of paper and a pen and wrote down one of the most beautiful hymns in the Christian world, and we sang it here today. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. You see, Horatio knew, just like David knew thousands of years ago before him, that God is on his side. That no matter the depths of despair we might find ourselves in, no matter how drastic the odds, no matter how deep the pit, we can, pro- we can proclaim with faith that it is well with our souls. And Horatio knew this because he had already experienced the total and complete salvation from the ultimate evil in this world. He had experienced salvation from sin through Christ the Lord. And he continues to write, My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to his cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. David cries out one last time in verse 8 of this psalm, that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And we proclaim this truth this truth to each other each time we gather as a body of Christ here at Hilltop United Methodist Church. We proclaim this truth today as the Holy Spirit baptizes little Andrew. And the truth we proclaim is this. Simply put, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let the people of God now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side. Amen.